All right. So, you know, we love to dig into the stuff you send us. And uh, you guys have been sending in a ton of articles about media coverage of the 2024 election. And there's this one theme that keeps popping up. It's kind of like uh, this idea that voters didn't really get the full picture of what was going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's fascinating, right? Yeah. And one article even mentions this study showing that in a blind test, voters actually preferred candidate Harris's policies. Hmm. Isn't that wild? It is. Yeah. It's like they liked her ideas on paper, mm -hmm. but then something happened between the paper and the voting booth. Right. Exactly. So that's what we're going to try to figure out today, like what was going on there. Yeah. And these articles suggest that the media's portrayal of the candidates might have had a lot to do with it. Media's portrayal. Yeah, it's almost like they were being seen through a distorted lens, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe the way the election was covered ended up influencing how people saw the candidates more than the actual policies themselves. Yeah, and that's powerful stuff. Yeah. Like, think about it. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's that whole idea that the medium is the message. Exactly. Mm. So what we're going to do today in this deep dive is really unpack how the media reported on the 2024 election. And then see how that might have, you know, shaped how voters understood. Or maybe misunderstood. Or misunderstood exactly the candidates. Okay, so let's start with something I think almost everyone remembers from this election. And that's how Trump's behavior just completely took over the news cycle. Right. I mean, every day it was something new, right? Yeah. These articles use words like crazy and horrific to describe it. It really did dominate everything. It's like a constant barrage, like I've... a new scandal every single day. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is that while it was captivating, that constant focus on Trump's actions might have actually stopped voters from really understanding the candidates' platforms. You know, it's like you're trying to listen to a symphony. Right. But there's someone like banging pots and pans next it's to you. That's a great analogy. You can't even appreciate the subtleties of the music with all that noise. Right. You just hear the banging. Exactly. So all that focus on Trump being Trump it might have actually distracted from, I know, what people really should have been paying attention to, like what they were actually planning to do, yeah. you know, once in office. Exactly. What were their plans? And that brings us to another problem the media had, how to talk about Trump's statements without, you know, giving them too much attention, especially when some of them were just plain false. Right. This whole idea of false equivalencies comes up a lot in these articles. Yeah, that's a tough one. Because if you just report what he said without any context or fact checking, doesn't that kind of give it more legitimacy than it deserves. Yes. Especially coming from someone with a track record of, you know, not always being completely truthful. Exactly. And one article even points to a specific example where a few big news outlets got it wrong. They labeled Trump's claim about Harris's stance on surgery for transgender prisoners as false. But it turned out to be true. Wow. That's a pretty big misstep. It makes you wonder what else they might have missed or misrepresented. It does. It's like if they got that wrong. Can you really trust them to give you the straight facts on anything? Exactly. It definitely raises questions about how reliable fact checking really is, especially with someone like Trump, who is known for, you know, making a lot of questionable claims. And in a fast paced news environment, too. Right? Oh, absolutely. It's tough to keep up with everything. OK, so let's move on to another big topic that came up in these articles. Biden's age. Yes. And the questions about, you know, whether he was really up to the job. Right. Was the media too hesitant to cover that or were they just as in the dark as everyone else. Well, the articles kind of go back and forth on that. Some journalists did raise concerns, but maybe not strongly enough for it to become like a major campaign issue. Mm -hmm. But then you have other outlets that basically dismissed any concerns about Biden's age as like partisan attacks. They even labeled those videos of him stumbling or, you know, misspeaking as cheap fakes. Wow. It makes you wonder if some in the media were so focused on portraying Trump as unfit yeah. That they kind of downplayed any potential weaknesses in Biden. It's possible, yeah. Like they were afraid to give any ammunition to the other side. Right. And, you know, that brings us to this broader discussion about the echo chamber effect. The echo chamber? How people are getting their news more and more from sources that just reinforce what they already believe. Yeah. It's like choosing to only listen to music you already know you like. Yeah. It's comfortable. But you might be missing out on some amazing new artists. Exactly. You're not expanding your horizons. Right. And it makes it almost impossible for any news source to reach a broad audience, you know, and actually bridge the political divide. So if everyone's stuck in their own little echo chamber, how can we even have a productive conversation about anything? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, it's like we're living in totally separate realities. Exactly. With our own sets of facts. Mm. 
And it's hard to see how to even begin to address that. Well, that's something that journalists and media critics are still trying to figure out. There are no easy answers, unfortunately. It's a tough one for sure. Yeah, it really does feel like we're at a crossroads. But let's maybe shift gears a bit mm. and talk about some of the potential solutions that these articles brought up. What were some of the things that stood out to you as ways to maybe improve election reporting? Well, one idea that I thought was really interesting was this emphasis on connecting policy discussions to the real world impact on voters' lives. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of just talking about tax cuts or health care reform in these abstract terms, actually show people how these policies would affect their wallets, their jobs, their access to health care, you know, the things that they actually experience every single day. Yeah, making it more tangible and relatable. Like one article gave this example. Instead of just reporting on the percentage of people who support a certain policy, journalists could tell the stories of like individuals and families who would be directly affected by it. Oh, like that. Put a human face on it. Exactly. It's not just numbers. It's real people. Right. It's about showing people that politics isn't just this game that's played by elites in Washington. It has real consequences for real people. And those consequences should be front and center in the coverage. Absolutely. It's about helping voters understand what's at stake for them personally and how their vote can actually make a difference. Another suggestion that I thought was interesting was this call for a clearer separation between reporting and commentary. You know, like, just the facts, ma'am. Right. Give people the information and then let them draw their own conclusions. Yeah, that's a big one especially now when it feels like the lines are so blurred. One article even argued that this blurring of lines contributes to the perception of media bias, even if the reporting itself is accurate. Right, because if you're always getting opinions mixed in with the facts, it's hard to know what to believe. Exactly. It's like trying to enjoy a meal where every bite has a different spice thrown in. <laughs> Eventually, you just lose your sense of taste. I like that. So how can journalists actually do this? I mean, it's one thing to say, separate reporting from commentary. Mm -hmm. But how do you actually pull that off? Well, one idea is to be much more clear about labeling opinion pieces. Make it super obvious to the reader that they're reading someone's opinion and not just straight news. Right. Another idea is to use different platforms. So maybe straight news goes on the main website or in the print edition. And then opinion pieces are in a totally separate section. I like that. Clear boundaries. No more bait and switch. Exactly. And then there's this idea of journalists being more transparent about their own biases, mm. not pretending that they don't have any, but actually acknowledging them up front. So it's like saying, hey, yeah. I'm a human being. I have my own set of experiences and beliefs just like you. But I'm going to do my best to present the facts fairly yeah. and let you make up your own mind. Exactly. That kind of transparency can go a long way in building trust, especially now when trust in the media is so low. OK, so those are some good ideas for how journalists can improve. But what about us, the people who are reading and watching the news? Yeah. What can we do to demand better from our media sources? It can't all be on the journalists. That's where the rubber meets the road. Right. We can't just sit back and passively consume whatever's thrown at us. We need to be more active, more discerning. Think of yourself as a detective. Okay, but... Examining the evidence, checking sources, separating fact from fiction. So it's not just about what the media does. It's about what we do, too. Absolutely. We have a responsibility to be informed and engaged citizens. We do. We need to be critical thinkers, question what we read and hear, consider different perspectives, and hold our media sources accountable. That's a tall order. It is. And it starts with being aware of our own biases. What are our preconceived notions? Where do we get our news from and why? Mm -hmm. Are we just looking for information that confirms what we already believe? It's about being honest with ourselves. It is. Recognizing that we all have blind spots. We do. And that our own perspective might not be the whole story. Exactly. And once we're aware of our biases, we can start to challenge them. Seek out information from a variety of sources, even sources we might not agree with. Ah, oh, it's tough. It is. But think of it like stretching a muscle. The more we do it, the more flexible our thinking becomes. We can also ask questions. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, why is this source presenting the information this way? What's their agenda? What evidence do they have? Are there other perspectives that aren't being represented? Those are all great questions to ask. It's about being curious and skeptical, not taking everything at face value. And being willing to change our minds. Yes. When we see new information. Exactly. Being a critical thinker doesn't mean being closed-minded. It means being open to the possibility that we might be wrong and being willing to adjust our beliefs when we see new evidence. And maybe most importantly, we need to be willing to call out misinformation. 
and hold our media sources accountable. If we see something that's just plain wrong, we need to speak up. We do. We can write letters to the editor, contact journalists directly, share our concerns on social media, use our voices to demand better. Absolutely. And we should support the outlets that are committed to accuracy and fairness. The quality of our media really reflects the quality of our democracy. Right. If we want informed citizens, we need a media that supports that. So it's a shared responsibility. It is. The media has a responsibility to report the news fairly and accurately. Yeah. And we have a responsibility to be critical thinkers. It's a partnership. And working together. We can create a media landscape that actually informs and empowers us. I like that. Okay, so we've talked about some potential solutions for the media. But before we wrap up, I want to leave our listeners with one final thought. Mm -hmm. We've talked about the media's role in shaping public perception. But what about social media? It's like this whole other layer on top of traditional media. Oh, yeah. The elephant in the room. And it's hard to separate the two. Social media has definitely become a major force in how we consume information. And it definitely played a big role in the 2024 election. And sometimes it feels like social media just makes all the worst parts of election coverage even worse. You know, yeah. the negativity, the misinformation, the echo chambers. It's like those algorithms are designed to keep us outraged, even if that outrage is based on false information. Right. You see a shocking headline or a meme that confirms your worst fears <laughs> and you can't help but share it. Even if you haven't checked if it's true. Right. It's like we're playing a game of telephone where the information gets more and more distorted with every retelling. And then people end up making decisions based on rumors instead of facts. It's a problem. So what do we do? Should we all just delete our social media accounts and go live in a cabin in the woods? Well, you could. Uh-huh. But for those of us who aren't ready to do that, there are things we can do to be more responsible. Okay. Like what? Give us some tips. Well, well for starters, we can be more careful about who we follow. And what information we share. Do those sources have a good reputation? Have they been fact-checked? Are they trying to be fair and balanced? Or are they just pushing an agenda? It's like doing a background check on the information. Exactly. Before we share it. We need to be more discerning about what we consume and spread. And more skeptical of those sensationalized headlines. Yes. If something seems too good to be true or too outrageous to be believable. It probably is. Right. And we can also engage in respectful dialogue with people who disagree with us. Oh, that's hard. It is. But it's important. It's easy to get stuck in our own echo chambers where everyone agrees with us, but that doesn't help us grow or learn. It's like staying in your comfort zone all the time. Exactly. Yeah. By talking to people who have different views, we can learn more about the world mm. and maybe even change our minds. And maybe even find some common ground. That would be great. In a world that feels increasingly divided. That would be a real victory. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. I mean, especially during an election. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You know all this information coming at you. It really is. And it's hard to know what to trust, what to ignore, right? what to question. And that's why it's so important to think critically, especially with social media. You can't just believe everything you see. So how do we actually do that? No. How do we become you know, more careful about what we believe. Well, one simple thing is to look at a lot of different sources. Instead of just getting your news from one or two places, branch out and see what other people are saying. So it's like yeah. if you watch a movie with a group of friends and then you all talk about it afterwards, everyone has a slightly different take. Right. And by sharing those different perspectives, you get a more complete picture of the movie. Exactly. And when it comes to news... That's really important. It helps us break out of our own little bubbles. Yeah, those echo chambers. And see things from different angles. And that's one of the things that worries me about social media. It feels like it's designed to just keep feeding us more of what we already believe. It does. Like the algorithm knows what you want to hear. And it just keeps giving you more of it. Whether it's true or not. Right. And that can be really dangerous. It's like being in a room full of people who all agree with you. Yeah, you feel like you're right. But you might actually be wrong. So how do we avoid falling into that trap? Well, one thing you can do is actually seek out sources that challenge your views. Really? Yeah. Follow people and organizations who have different opinions, even if those opinions make you uncomfortable. So it's not about agreeing with everything you read. No. It's about seeing the bigger picture, considering different perspectives. It's like trying a new food. Exactly. You might not like it. But you might. But at least you tried it. And you expanded your palate. Another thing I think is important is paying attention to how we feel when we read something. 
Hmm. Like if a headline or a post makes you really angry hmm. or scared, maybe take a step back right. and ask yourself why you're feeling that way. Because strong emotions can cloud our judgment and make us more likely to believe something that's not true. So when you feel that surge of anger or fear, take a breath and think about it. It's like hitting the pause button on a movie oh, exactly. before you jump to conclusions. Give yourself time to process what you're seeing. And then, of course, there's fact checking. Oh, that's crucial. It's so easy to share something without even thinking about it. Especially if it fits with what you already believe. But we have a responsibility to make sure what we're sharing is actually true. They do. And there are websites that can help with that. Yeah. Right? There are great resources out there, like Snopes and PolitiFact. They can help you figure out if something is real or fake. And remember, anyone can fall for misinformation. It's not about being gullible. It's about being aware of how it spreads. And protecting ourselves from it. Exactly. So it sounds like we need to be really proactive. Mm hmm Especially with social media. We do. Diversify our sources. Yes. Challenge our own biases. Fact yeah. check everything. And be willing to have respectful conversations with people who disagree with us. That's a lot. It is. But it's worth it. Because it's about protecting our democracy. It is. Wow. This has been a really insightful conversation. It has. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure to have you on. It's always fun to be here. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll see you next time for another Deep Dive. See you then.